So maybe we should get started. We're a little, running a little bit behind. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Jennifer Walsh, who will be moderator of this session. Uh, as of July 1st, Jennifer became the uh, dean of the College of Environmental Design here at uh, Berkeley. She's also the uh, William Worcester Professor of City and Regional Planning um, at the University of California. Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, we have a great uh, panel lined up for this hour, uh, focusing on technology, codes, and implementation in green buildings. And what I'd like to do is simply introduce the panelists a little bit so you know who's going to be speaking. And, um, and then we, we have a, um, a, a, a well-worked-out plan for uh, our, our panel, and then we'll be opening it up for discussion. Um, uh, Catherine Wolfram is uh, a, a faculty member at the Haas School of Business, and she is the co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas. Her research is uh, focusing on business regulation, um, the restructuring of the electricity industry, um, and energy and environmental economics. And um, she's going to be talking uh, a little bit this morning uh, to get us started on uh, codes and what are the arguments for codes, uh, what kinds of distortions do they create, what types of unintended consequences as well. Um, so that's Catherine. Um, we're also going to be uh, hearing from Alan Sandstead. Alan uh, is at LBNL, and he, uh, he works uh, within the, the Energy and Environment Division at the lab on uh, end use for, uh, with the End Use Forecasting Program. And uh, that is a program that looks at energy technology and policy, uh, energy forecasting, and does extensive work uh, for EPA and DOE. Um, and we, we, our third uh, panelist is um, Phil Williams. Phil Williams is the Vice President for Sustainability at WebCore, which is um, uh, the largest general contractor in the state of California. Um, Phil chairs uh, the uh, UC College of Environmental Design Center uh, for the Built Environment, um, which is a NSF-funded uh, industry uh, academic uh, consortium that has really done great things here at Berkeley uh, in terms of getting important research on the built environment and energy efficiency uh, done and delivered and disseminated to the folks that uh, need to know about it every day. Um, and he's also uh, chair of, of the, the mayor's green building task force in the city of San Francisco. Um, and our last panelist is Dave Pogue. Dave is the National Director for Sustainability at uh, CBRE. Um, and CBRE uh, is uh, an, an enormous real estate enterprise. And uh, Dave is responsible for sustainability programs and facility management uh, portfolios in the Americas. And that's uh, 1.1 billion square feet of space. Um, uh, uh, CBRE is working with the U.S. Green Building Council um, and uh, participating in their work on lead uh, existing buildings uh, portfolio program and um, has done a lot of work also with Energy Star and um, has been recognized um, uh, just last year as Energy Star Partner of the Year and also received a U.S. Uh, GBC award. So um, this is a panel that has uh, extensive expertise in the question of energy efficiency and codes and what they mean, and, um, and I, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce them. So, uh, as I said, Catherine is uh, going to begin uh, by laying out uh, some of the arguments ab about building codes. Uh, we're then going to hear from Alan, who will talk about the gaps between codes and practice, and also relative orders of magnitude in terms of what codes can achieve um, and, and versus other opportunities for energy efficiency. Uh, we'll then hear from Phil. Um, who is going to uh, be talking about uh, the Bay Area and the, some of the very progressive codes in the Bay Area and what they uh, have meant um, in terms of everyday practice, um, what kind of opportunities they provide. And then we'll finish with uh, Dave, who is going to talk about some of the limitations of codes um, and, and why we might want to also be thinking very, uh, uh, in a very focused way about building operations. And then we'll, we'll have a, a general discussion amongst the panelists and open it up for Q&A. Um, so, Catherine, I turn it over to you. 
Great, thanks Jennifer. So as Jennifer said, I wanted to start by talking at an abstract level about some of the pros and cons associated with codes and then hopefully the rest of the panel can fill in and talk about the real world and whether these, these issues really are, uh, are relevant there. As a starting point, I think it's useful just to say that I'm talking about codes as a way to reduce energy use in buildings. That's the, the social goal is to reduce energy use in buildings. We can talk about why that might be, but I'm going to abstract from that. You, you might want to reduce energy use because you think there are externalities associated with energy use because of the uh, energy security issues, but let's use that as a starting point. So think about different ways in which you might want to reduce energy use in buildings. What I want to start with as a uh, comparison for codes is, is kind of the economic nirvana. Just raise the prices. If you want people to use less of a good, raise the price of it, and they'll respond to these economic incentives and, and use less energy. Uh, I'm not advocating this, but I just think it's a useful kind of counterpoint to think of it uh, relative to codes. So let me step through some of the arguments for why codes might be more effective than just simply raising, raising energy prices. And these are, are not unique to me. These are things that a lot of people have thought about. So the first, th this is a, these are all examples of what are called market failures. Why just raising prices, why kind of using a market incentive won't work. So the first uh, market failure, or possible market failure, is what's known as the principal agent problem. And here, in this context, the idea is that the principal, the building owner who's making decisions affect, that affect the agent, in this case, the tenant. So the, the building owner might have an incentive to buy a less expensive HVAC system, whereas the tenant might want the, the more expensive energy efficient HVAC system. And if there's some kind of information asymmetry or if there's some reason why the tenant you know, can't pick a building based on its, its, the efficiency of its HVAC system, um, then you'll get a distortion here, that the, the building owner is making decisions that affect the tenant's energy bills uh, and, and making a decision that's not necessarily necessarily what the tenant would have done for themselves. Another type of principal agent problem that would show up in this context is, is within the firm. All firms would like to minimize their costs, but you've got to assign people a role of, of minimizing particular costs. And so not all firms have kind of an energy czar who's responsible for thinking about energy costs and responsible for thinking about how to, how to minimize them. So you, you might just not have anyone who's accountable for, um, for energy usage and, and not be thinking about every possible way to minim minimize the energy usage within a building. So both of these issues kind of assume that there's poor information about what to do within a building to minimize the energy use. About, for instance, um, at the tenant building owner level, there, there's poor information that the tenant uses in evaluating which buildings to use, that they're not using the energy efficiency of the, of the building um, in making that decision. Another possible uh, market failure, another breakdown is just, and, and I think this is probably more relevant in the residential context, although I'll be curious to hear about people, whether people think this is relevant in a commercial context, um, but another explanation that people lay out is that they're capital constraints. That People want to buy the more energy efficient refrigerator, but that costs $400 more than the less energy efficient refrigerator. And so um, just kind of going through the, the thought process, they know that they'll save money over the next 10 years, but they don't have that extra $400 right now. So that's a, a potential reason why you might not see uh, the right level of investment in energy efficient technologies with higher prices and why you might want to set some kind of uh, minimum energy um, efficiency code. I think there are also some behavioral explanations that, that don't invoke kind of rational economic behavior on the part of, of, of all the actors. And I personally think that these are probably a large part of, of what's going on, particularly at the residential level. Um, so you might think that people procrastinate. They, they know that it's the right thing to do to lay more insulation in their attic, but every weekend comes around and they're just better things, uh, the better things to do. Um, or that people have limited attention, that, that for instance in the landlord-tenant arrangement that there are lots and lots of things to consider when you're are considering renting office space and energy efficiency might be number 17 on the list. So it's just kind of too many things to, to keep track of at, at one time. So these are all reasons why we might not want to rely on prices. But you also want to think about 
if prices aren't the right mechanism to get people to do um, to use energy in the way we want them to use them, are codes the right answer? Is are codes the other um, only alternative? So, for instance, if you think that there are just poor information. Um, if, if poor information is the problem, then maybe we should improve information. So um, maybe we'll get into it, but there's now uh, AB 1103, which requires uh, in any commercial transaction involving a building, the reporting of the building's energy use over the past 12 months. And, and they're trying to make it kind of presentable in a standardized format that's easy for people to, to look at. Um, or if it's capital constraints, you might want to think about ways uh, to improve the financing arrangements, as, as with the, the PACE um, type arrangements. So those are, those are things to think about in, in thinking about uh, why we might want to rely on codes. If you think that there are these important market failures and we've decided to rely on codes, let me point out a couple uh, kind of unintended consequences that having building codes might um, might, might bring up. So for one thing, codes are an example of something that's known as a vintage differentiated regulation. These are codes that apply to, to new buildings or to retrofits on existing buildings and don't apply to the old buildings. You know, you can't just blanket say every single building in California has to comply to Title 24. Um, so for practical reasons, they're, they're differentially applied to, to buildings of different vintages. So the, the economic literature suggests that this can lead to some distortions. So for one thing, it might lead to the distortion that people are reluctant to retrofit their building. They're reluctant to bring it, to, to make changes to the building that bring it um, more up to date because doing so invokes all these expensive building codes that they'll have to do. So I'm sure we've all heard examples of people who, uh, let's take the residential uh, context, people who hire un unlicensed contractors, you know, people who do whatever they need to do to make it a, a retrofit that doesn't trigger the building codes. You know, they leave one of the old beam standing, and for some reason that, that um, doesn't invoke the new codes. Um, and so if people are making distortions, if making decisions involving distortions like this in order to evolve the codes, that can be um, an additional distortion of the codes. So, so if people are making decisions like that, if they're delaying retrofitting a building in a way that would make it slightly more energy efficient because they don't want to invoke the codes, then, then that can even lead to, to lower energy efficiency than if um, without the codes. I mean, that's an extreme, an extreme outcome, but, but there is that kind of um, possible dynamic. Just to, to give you another example of this, there's some work that's shown that with the corporate average fuel economy standards, that's an example again of a vintage differentiated regulation, that that um, increased the sale of used cars. It made used cars more attractive because the new cars had to apply, had to comply with the fuel efficiency standards and they were more, um, they were, they were more expensive. So two other quick issues that I want to raise on codes. Um, one is, the, the one way to think about codes is that they're just a, a minimum quality standard. Everyone has to comply with this. And every time you apply a standard, you're, you're erasing some range of choice over which consumers or producers um, can make decisions. So there are people out there who really like to take the really high flow showers, right? And if you impose a code on a low flow shower head, then you're, you're removing. There are people out there who would pay a lot of money to take that high flow um, shower, but if you, t if you impose the code, you're, you're removing that option for them. Um, so you're just, I think you can put this in the, the commercial building context. Think about buildings that, um, that aren't going to be used very much, that might not want to pay to invest to, to bring them up to, to the energy efficiency codes. So the last thing I want to lay out, and hopefully some of the other panelists will address this, is the issue of enforcement um, and, and how um, you can write codes on the book, but, but how they actually get enforced in practice is another issue that, that bears on how effective they are at reducing energy use. So those are the kind of abstract uh, academic layout of the issues associated with codes. And as I said, hopefully some of the other panelists will address the, um, the real world relevance of those issues. Great. Can Alan. Stand? What? Uh, Can I stand? Yeah, 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 because here's the thing. Uh, I want to build on uh, Catherine's remarks and anticipate the remarks of my co-panelists. Uh, and 
uh, say a, a few words about codes from the standpoint of uh, large-scale greenhouse gas abatement, uh, climate policy, as it were, uh, not just energy policy, and, and make the point that those two are quite different. Uh, and uh, to complement the questions about efficiency and so forth and possible distortions, think about bang for the buck. Uh, we are, as you all know, uh, both in California and the United States, other countries internationally, trying to achieve very rapid changes in the energy system in order to, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, energy efficiency is now being pursued very aggressively, uh, more aggressively probably than any time in history, and uh, building codes, both in California and at the national level, are sort of one of the, one of the core uh, um, policies that are, that are being pursued, uh, building codes more widely promulgated and more stringent than those we have now. So. The first point I want to make is that from the standpoint of uh, greenhouse gases, if you have, you think about the energy system emitting greenhouse gases, for a given configuration of energy supply with respect to carbon, uh, greenhouse gases are proportional to demand, absolute electricity, say, uh, not uh, intensity. Um, our, we use some of the common metrics for intensity uh, uh, per, per person, per GDP, uh, but the atmosphere cares about molecules. And so I want to make a first point about the order of magnitude, my first slide. This is uh, some of the same information, exactly the same information that Art presented, but presented a little differently. Uh, this is um, the C California history, uh, data from the Energy Commission, starting back in 1980, uh, but sort of you can think about it going back to the left. And this is actual uh, statewide electricity consumption, not per capita, not per gross state product. Uh, the blue area is, uh, represents what we actually, the state actually consumed in electricity. Uh, and the, the orange is that which was saved by building codes, and the green is that which was saved by all the other efficiency programs. So this is, Art had one slide that had this in microscale. This is the macro scale. Um, as you can see, the, from this perspective, this sort of, I th to my mind, brings home the point about the, the orders of magnitude that have been achieved historically from these policies. And California is you know, commonly uh, uh, understood to have the most aggressive policies of this type in the country. Um, this is about a 10% difference as of uh, the year 2005. So I think it's, it's good to have this sort of reality check on if we're talking about if uh, the policy issue is the whole area, uh, that's what we need to work on for greenhouse gases. And this is the historical result of uh, these policies in California. Then we have to think about, this, you might say, this links us to trying to make these policies much more stringent, which is uh, going on. Now, can you sh do it? So, not yet. Put that down, please. Um, so, the uh, building codes, as Catherine mentioned, I believe, you know, they're sort of historically were uh, thought of a minimum compliance standard. Uh, to make a very long story short, what's being attempted now is to make building codes uh, uh, promote or require, in some cases, not the sort of technology efficiency floor, the minimum efficiency of technology widespread, but the technology seeing, ceiling. In other words, they're using being much more as a technology conceived of as a forcing issue. Um, more, more stringent codes requiring more levels of energy efficiency uh, and consequent greenhouse gas abatement. Now, now you can bring the next slide. So, this is a slide, I want to make a point about um, uh, sort of not uncertainty, but the way the world works. Uh, this, there's a, this is a slide I took from a, uh, a widely cited paper last year by the New Buildings Institute on the energy performance of lead buildings. There's a certain amount of controversy in this paper. Uh, the data were reanalyzed. Um, I'm agnostic to all those things about whether lead is, you know, the energy benefits of lead or not. Uh, but this slide nicely captures what's sort of been a, a long understood pattern in the, in the efficiency world about the, the, the spread between uh, predicted energy savings from, for example, either building codes, also retrofits, and uh, um, the, out, the actual outcomes. Now, in this uh, slide, uh, the conclusion of the study was uh, lead buildings, the sample I looked at, they do save energy on average, but there's an enormous spread uh, on a building to building basis, okay? Uh, whatever the merits or, or shortcomings of this study, this is, a sp this is something that's been seen for a long time. Uh, going back to the 1980s, 1970s, uh, retrofit projects on uh, residential or commercial. Uh, retrofit, you know, collections of, of uh, uh, buildings that are uh, subject to retrofit. On average, these, uh, the retrofits actually will, on 
often save money, but the building variation is tremendous. And uh, what this, what as you see here, uh, you can't see from the picture. On average, these buildings did save energy, quite a lot of energy, actually, relative to um, uh, sort of the, the benchmark. But some of them say used a lot more energy than was predicted, and some of them actually had energy that was greater than I think what their benchmark was, the existing code. So. <clears throat> Uh, I want to go back to the McKinsey curve. There's been a lot of controversy over decades now about that negative cost part. Um, many people in this room have contributed to this literature about, you know, what's that about? Does it make sense and so forth? Uh, I want to uh, interpret that in a, in a certain way, which is that one thing that's, um, to my mind, sort of singular about energy efficiency policies and has been since their inception, as Art described in California 35 years ago, is that the, the justification is uh, several fold for these policies. They've, they're now and always have been um, part of the rationale for the policies is to reduce energy use, now greenhouse gases. But they're also um, justified in terms of providing private benefits, not just social benefits in terms of environmental externalities, but private benefits. Okay? The requirement in the, reg in the regulatory process is that the code save private individuals money. So in that sense, um, the codes aren't subject exactly to a cost-benefit test is, you know, in terms of econ zero. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the, 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 the criteria is somewhat different. And so now, you know, because of this in part, uh, one gets the controversy about negative cost. Um, whatever is true about that, so there's a lot to say about that, and, and Catherine introduced some of those issues. Uh, as codes get more stringent, and the, uh, the legislation that is uh, been now considering the Waxman-Markey bill at the U.S. Senate, not only to make national building codes, but to up enforcement. It's known that code compliance across the country is uh, very spotty. So there will be more resources to enforcement, um, penalties of some kinds for failure to comply. So as we get to pushing the envelope of codes in this direction, this heterogeneity is going to become paramount, I think. It's already important, but it, we're really going to hit up against this in the sense that uh, sometimes these kinds of pictures are used to uh, uh, make a claim about the shortcomings of the energy simu building simulation models. But you know, a model is a model. In some sense, this is the right answer. Okay, uh, buildings and their their use pattern are extremely heterogeneous. That's just the way things work. Uh, the subtext here is that you one cannot predict. Uh, reliably of uh, individual buildings energy use solely by its technological and engineering characteristics. So the, I think this has an implication for how we think about codes going forward in the context of greenhouse gas abatement. Um, the information problems that Catherine mentioned, uh, I think those are real, but we're now also moving to an era in which whatever else is true, uh, information has become widespread and plentiful. Uh, information about available to consumers and firms about their building energy use. Uh, the, there's information technology, labeling programs are coming along that uh, everybody's going to have a lot of information. And then the question becomes, as people have, they actually know, they will be able to identify themselves, okay? They will know what these outcomes are in practice. And the question I want to raise for discussion and for further thought is, uh, how do you think about a, something like a building code which applies, is designed to apply to buildings and not to you know, user, user behavior, uh, when regulators will no longer have any monopoly of information about, uh, about energy use over uh, private individuals, and there will be opportunities for much more robust markets, possibly, in energy information and energy use. I think the implication of this is that, uh, uh, for public policy, at least one implication is that enforcing, uh, promulgating and enforcing uh, really enforcing compliance with uh, minimum code standards across the country is, uh, should be possibly weighted more than it is uh, being weighted now. I think the, the use of uh, very highly stringent codes as a technology forcing uh, policy uh, is going to be problematic for these reasons. Thank you. It's interesting. One of the comments that I think would have is that we recognize there's a fair amount of momentum going on in codes. So from my perspective, whether we're going to be the people who are invited to that conversation in terms of the overall public policy, I think it's an important one. And I think I can, I can preface that based upon some personal experience based upon the Bay Area. Uh, whether you're in San Jose today or whether you're in Oakland today or whether you're in San Francisco today or Los Angeles today or San Diego today, 
there are green building codes that apply to various levels of new commercial buildings and or even residential buildings. So I think we need to recognize, in some respects, it's already started to happen. So what lessons can we learn about those codes that may have already been adopted outside of the state standards? What lessons can we learn based upon those little micros that could potentially used in the macro side? And the personal example I'd like to be able to have is that in, in many cases, in some respects, whether you're a developer, a builder, or as seen as a special interest group, uh, or whether it's just the personal passion of those people who are involved in government, um, the ability to integrate those two is very, very important. And the example I'm going to give is in San Francisco, where they had 10 people from the private sector get together, and no one from the city of San Francisco was a voting member of this mayor's task force. We had 90 days to come up with a green building recommendation or report. The city staffers were there from planning, from the Department of Public Works, um, from the Department of Building Inspection, and from the San Francisco Department of the Environment as advisors on factual information that we could draw upon. Owners, builders, architects, bankers. In 90 days, we came up with a plan that the city would have never envisioned happening that in within the course of a year, every building over 25,000 square feet in San Francisco had to be at least lead certified silver and gold by 2012. And then every new residential building had to comply with the build it green standard for residential. They would have never envisioned that they could write a code that was that stringent, okay? And the key part about it was, is that we were able to step over those issues that are problem creators for those in, in architecture or building were in construction. We're used to change. Just tell us what the change is going to be and we can plan for it. Give us phased implementations. It'll give us an opportunity to get to where we want to go within the reasonable technology that's available. Make sure that we have an opportunity to have known standards that we can all rely on, whether it's LEED or another standard in USGBC, that I can have an architect in Boston or Austin or San Francisco design a building for me and not worry about the individual peculiarities of a piece of code. And make sure that it's performance-based versus prescriptive. You know, generally codes aren't viewed as very progressive things. They're kind of painful things that don't change very rapidly and that it becomes that floor to work with. That's traditional prescriptive based code when you open up the book and the guy in the planning office can see you know, what the distance is between your toilet and your door. That's code. The key in terms of energy and operation really needs to be a more performance based opportunity that lets you take a look at your building as a holistic entity, where it sits in the environment, how it's going to be used, those kind of performance-based codes, I think, have a lot more relevance in terms of this big animal that we've got in front of us. Um, I also will let you know that I think codes probably affect the bottom 25% of the market. I think in the case of the codes in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland, the commercial real estate market in the area that we work with had adopted LEED as their de facto entry into the market well before code. There's the first 10% adopters, then there's the next 25%, then there's a 50% fast followers who are basically doing it because their competitor is doing it, and they're not sure exactly why, but they know if it's good for him, it's good for me, and I have to be competitive in the marketplace. Those are the realities of sort of the business world, and, and I'm gonna, I almost think that we're asking a business to transform that is probably one of the most conservative businesses that are available. However, buildings are there for a long time, decades. I mean, we can change a light bulb from an incandescent to a complex fluorescent with about three turns of my wrist. Buildings are there for decades. And the opportunity to make them transform themselves exists. And I'm going to use the example of, I have a building with electric lights and you don't. You put electric lights in your building. Um, I know Alexander Graham Bell, and Dave, you don't, and I've got telephones in my building, and you don't have yours, you put them in. Elias Otis and Elevators, Willis Carrier for air conditioning, and getting the internet in your building. Some of these new buildings will, in fact, create market pressures that will cause the commercial real estate market with no code to be able to understand what their tenants want, what the economic drivers are in the marketplace. Those kind of examples will, in some respects, get the 75% of the market to where they need to be, in some respects. And the other, let code sort of pull up those folks who are never going to get there on their own 
um, whether they don't have the time inclination or they view it as a political polar bear issue, right? It's not just always business as much as we'd like to think it is. Um, I also want to recognize that I think that new buildings are extremely interesting and they really set the tone for new technology and involvement. I think that those are the f adopt movers. There's that sexy feel we talked about to doing PV versus caulk. You know, it's, it's what should you rather put your money on? <laughs> At the same time, I, I think we need to recognize there's a certain amount of evolution and revolution, but migration is a huge factor in terms of how buildings be able to progress. Um, and I think that's going to be one of those key factors because frankly code doesn't move fast. Once you implement code it has a tendency to stay where it is and you've set a benchmark and then you have to revisit every five to six to ten years. To me that's a potential issue that we're going to have to be able to deal with. Um, one of the biggest factors and Dave and I were talking about a little bit earlier is you know the General Services Administration is the largest property owner in the United States. They rent a tremendous amount of space. And when they've set their own personal standard to reduce their energy consumption by 35% and have a LEED certification on their commercial new buildings, retrofits, and commercial interiors, anybody in the real estate market who ever thinks that they want to use a tenant like the government who has long-term leases, pays well, you know, those are kind of nice things to have. The market is going to move to those kind of things. So the opportunity to create incentives are extremely important, but I think market pressures um, are gonna make it extremely important to be able to do that. Um, and given that kind of timelines that we've seen in the California Energy Commission, industry can respond with technologies if you're given that opportunity. So for us, I'm much more on the implementation side. Um, but one of the things that I would really also like to make sure is that we recognize there's a certain amount of science and architecture and engineering where we have left the, our building market sort of devoid of, in, uh, of innovation. Um, and I think if we just give this a little bit more time, I think that in, in the course of months, not years, you're going to see those people, we're so fortunate to be here in Silicon Valley with venture capitalists and those people who recognize money can be made, they've done it before, they're going to do it again. We're going to see some very smart technology that's going to be implemented in buildings again in months, not years, and not decades, that can almost transform some of this work that we've got. Um, and I think that's where codes sometimes have a tendency to be late adopters as opposed to early adopters. So whatever we do, and I know we're going to do it, I think we have to be able to understand that that kind of private sector involvement in a proactive position as opposed to reactionary is going to be much more powerful. So anybody in this room who thinks they're going to write a code someday in their city or county or state needs to recognize that that private sector may get you there further and faster than you would on your own and with a lot less headaches in the end. Thanks. It's said on, wait for applause on the yeah. um, I, I'm Dave Pogue. Uh, when I came in this morning and I met Larry, whoever Larry is, he said, oh, I, I recognize your name. You're not the Dave Pogue who writes for the New York Times. Um, so if any of you came today thinking that you were going to hear the newest technology and what you could get your loved one for Christmas, I, I'm not that Dave Pogue. I have some ideas for you, but um, so I suspect that if you want a small refund, they'll probably give it to you. Um, but I am the Dave Pogue, who is the National Director of Sustainability for C.B. Richard Ellis. And at first I thought that I was going to be here and I was going to take the practical, capitalistic, uh, let the market decide sort of approach. But, uh, but my buddy here and I uh, felt we agree on most everything. So I will, I will just ditto what he says. Um, uh, the one difference for us is that this billion square feet that we manage, it's what I like to call the rest of the mess. Um, it's not new. In many cases, it's not bright and shiny. Uh, it really represents the average, typical, sometimes very high profile, but these are all older buildings across the United States. <clears throat> and so our, our approach has to be extremely practical. Um, I think also, and I, I, I will reiterate several of the points that other people have made here. This whole movement, if you will, started probably three or four years ago. So we're relatively new into this. 
um, not respecting some of the things like Title 24 in the state of California and other things that I think California has been quite progressive. But it was only about four years ago that we as an organization began getting involved in sustainability. But how we started was really around energy. And we got involved with energy, again, not because of, of, of kind of esoteric sorts of save the world sorts of things, but because energy became expensive. So there was, in fact, a price point upon which it became painful uh, to our clients. And so we began looking at ways to reduce energy, and, and that, frankly, evolved more broadly into the sustainability kinds of programs that we've gotten into, which is really much more around waste and water and triple bottom line and all the rest of these things. But it started with energy and energy efficiency. Um, and and I, will, I will, again, reflect back to Title 24. California has the best uh, regulations. I used to be a developer. I have sinned. Um, and so uh, Title 24 is a great group of regulations, and buildings were built well to those. The problem that we find, even in California, is that most of the buildings are not managed to the standards to which they were built. In fact, I tell this story, and I get in trouble, and one of my clients is here today, and I don't mean your buildings at all. Um, but what we find in a lot of other buildings is that buildings have been run and are currently run to the demand of the most demanding tenant, think the attorney on the 38th floor, and they are managed to the capability of the least capable engineer. Somewhere in between there is how these buildings are being run. So we get involved with these buildings, and almost universally we will find that buildings can be run better than they are being run today, notwithstanding the fact that they were built to a pretty arduous code. So if what we're thinking about is trying to take Title 24 and making that uh, universal across all the states, which I would suggest that it should be, there's still an aspect about, about how you use the building, about what you do with it after time, about it, whether or not you're checking on after you've built this thing. It's really, in our view, it's about how you manage these. And we're very incremental in our approach. Um, almost every building that we look at and that we go into, if we put one of our engineers and look at it, we can make it better. Uh, even the ones that are well built. And, and a couple of interesting things here. First of all, I know that USGBC has been criticized, frankly, for the lead in C standards. 25% or more of the lead in C, and that scatter graph that you had would have shown this, I think. It, I understand that 25% of the lead in C buildings, these are the best of the best of the buildings, actually perform worse than the average building uh, on EPA Energy Star. So they're built to these great standards but then they're not put into practice when they're there. Uh, the other point of this is that I was speaking with the, our, our friends at the EPA, and they gave me a slide, which I should have brought if I was gonna bring slides. We were told we weren't bringing slides. Um, <laughs> you weren't bringing slides. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I have a slide, and, and the slide was, uh, the, the EPA was trying to evaluate the difference between performance of the top 25 percentile, those buildings that are Energy Star labeled, and the bottom 25 percentile, trying to figure out what was the differentiator. And the presumption going in is that obviously the better performing buildings had better stuff. Um, and what they actually found, and this would be on my slide, was that most of these things, uh, variable speed drives, economizers, there actually were almost as much of these and more as, as prevalent in the bad buildings as in the better performing buildings. So again, it comes out that it's really not so much about how you build the building, but how you manage the building. Um, and so we're, we're really uh, pro-market. Um, again, we talked about, the, I think Phil said it's a conservative, that building, to, please trust me, they are conservative. I'm the only socialist in the business. Um, but it is also much more becoming a responsive industry. Back when I was sinning as a developer, the development business was very much driven by charismatic artists who were using as their palette concrete and steel and glass and creating marketplaces. Those days are gone. Uh, the artist is gone. It's now a very practical kind of business, and it's very responsive. What does the tenant want? What does the occupant want? And that's where we're focusing our attention. And I know now that there's been three or four major academic studies uh, I, I met Nels uh, in Florida and, and, and John in Florida last year as we were talking about one of the papers that you all did. Gary Paivo with ASU did a second one. Uh, Norm Miller uh, with CoStar a third. And then we recently have partnered with Norm Miller on a fourth study trying to look at the performance of sustainable buildings in their market. And right now there's so few labels or ways to understand what a sustainable building is that what you focus on is those small portion of lead, but also the Energy Star labeled buildings. That's what ours just did. It looked at 154 Energy Star labeled buildings. So it's about energy. Our view was that if you're Energy Star labeled, you probably are other sustainable factors in there, uh, but it's energy first. 
And what the, all of these studies have found, to varying degrees and to varying numbers, is that these buildings perform better than their peer set in rental achievement and in occupancy. The, the report that we just did, or the study that we just did on 154 buildings, found that there was a 13% improvement in rent. So what that means over time, if tenants are taking these buildings and wanting to come into these buildings, and the thing that we did in our study was that we also surveyed 3,000 tenants. What do the tenants want? And what we found, to a great degree, these folks, and we had more than 750 respondents, they felt that sustainability was important. They felt that they would look for it next time. A fair portion of them said that they would pay higher rent. Um, so by and large now, if we can begin to move not only the building industry and make those changes, and there are owners, frankly, who are altruistic. I, I, uh, my client here uh, would deny, Nick, Nick Stilatis, was, was, he and I were chatting just today about how you know, capitalists and, and capital is, is non-altruistic. But I think that we do have a number of clients, including Tia Kreff, who have a socially responsible bent on putting their money into things. So there is a social responsibility around a lot of our clients. But also there is an economic. And so if we can begin to combine these and if we can find that tenants actually care, then a lot of this will move without code, without compliance, without the market will make these things uh, move. So by and large, again, we are broadly in, in, in involved in the marketplace. And also there's some degree that we would like to allow our more enlightened clients who have chosen to make their buildings better and more efficient and that that perhaps through something like AB 1103 is now part of the market data and so that people can make informed choices. We think to a great degree that the market ought to reward the first movers and the people who choose to do the right thing in these buildings. So from our perspective, um, I, uh, codes are great. And again, I think that maybe for the bottom piece, but for really kind of performance here, we like the market. Thanks. And there's some great buys on digital cameras that I'll talk to you about later. Uh, uh, thank you all. Um, I guess I'd like to kick it off by asking the panelists if they have questions of each other that they want to raise. Yeah, yeah, I definitely do. So anytime I see a scatter plot with uh, points going all over the place, I want to think about what's explaining them. And to me, it seems like uh, there's the 24-7 call center, and then there's the GSA, and they're going to use buildings very differently. So how, I mean, how do you, what, what is a badly managed building, and how do you know it's not just a call center that's using it 24-7 as opposed to 9 to 5? Well, the first thing that we do is that we benchmark buildings, obviously, and we use the EPA program. And the EPA Energy Star program allows for differences of use. Okay. And, and type. So it will take all call centers against all call centers and all typical kind of buildings against all buildings. And so, frankly, we just look for that scatter graph. We look for the stars, and we try to elevate them, and we look for the pigs and try to make them better. So what's, what's an example of a pig? What are you doing if you're a pig? Um, you know, you probably have, a, a, you may have a great automatic uh, system, but that someone has manually overridden it. You're probably running the building 24-7. Uh, uh, one of the things, for instance, that buildings do all across the country and that we're starting to stop, it has been a standard of commercial leases for years that you offer Saturday hours as part of the operating standard. So you run the building from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then you, you operate it from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m., say, on, on Saturday whether anybody ever comes into the building. Mm. And so we've gotten involved now with our, with our tenants, even though the lease is, still says the hours of operation include Saturday, we describe to our tenants what we're trying to do and we say, look, instead of us doing it just because, let's do it on demand. And so we reduce um, six out of 66 hours just by making that one change. So there's those kinds of things. We also go, we've tried to replace all the incandescent bulbs. We've gone through and we've looked at all the low hanging fruit. And that's actually an interesting piece here. Most of the stuff that can be done is really low cost, no cost. A, a, a case in point, uh, we recently took a building that had Energy Star 61 less than two years ago, and last week, two weeks ago, Friday, it got a uh, lead uh, EB Gold and had Energy Star label of 94. So it moved from 61 to 94, and we spent 60 cents a foot in capital. So a lot of it is about just doing the right thing right, hours of operation, set points, uh, set points on the mechanical. We actually wrote 101 tips to successful sustainability that I will send to you if you wish. I guess you know, as a guy who has you know, come from an engineering background as a builder, I was not surprised at all with that graph. I mean, when you look at it, those programs that are almost designed for that code compliance are not really operationally based. The folks who wrote those might begrudgingly say it was never intended necessarily to provide true operation linearity. 
Now, I do think, however, that there's going to be some opportunities now to work with guys like Dave. I now, rather than have a, a predictive analysis that's done two years before the building is ever built, which is mainly what happens when you do your computer runs on code, what would happen if I had the utility bills from the last 10 years of operation? And I could put some in smart wireless sensors on my building that would very easily help me segregate to know where those heavy hitters are to make those easy choices a lot more interesting for my uh, developer builder, where I could now almost create that ROI based upon individual performance criteria. Those kind of technology involvements, and then I've got this wonderful database that I can link back to my computer program that I can now really understand what those, rather than anecdotally, I can actually start to get an improvement loop. I think that's the kind of work that'll help those existing buildings. But to, to somehow make the, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times that puts lead on this pedestal, frankly, that's any building in California, lead or no lead, operationally. Um, one, one of the things that I would also like to mention is that one of the things that we probably don't recognize is that as much as the Class A or nice Class B office buildings appear to be a significant portion of the energy use, there's a tremendous amount of industrial opportunities. There's a, tr a lot of work that doesn't get the full attention of the architectural A&E community that probably needs a whole different specific set of issues. Because I think we all love AB 1103 in terms of that creating that market. But again, the differentiation on some of those product types creates real problems. <laughs> It works. Uh, I want to ask uh, both Dave and Phil if, if um, to uh, uh, think forward in terms of the market trends that you were describing. If, if things keep going as they are now and, and expand, the sustainability movement, the move toward uh, carbon policy and so forth, uh, what, will the, uh, what will the whole building stock look like in 20 years? Uh, in terms of you know the, the big picture, you know, I mean, will it turn it? Could is that enough to actually make it turn a corner? If there's financing to go with it, you know, I think it, it's uh, a money to, issue. To define financing. Well, I, given an opportunity for somebody, and I've seen whether it's the city of Berkeley or the county of Sonoma, whatever they're going to do, providing some means to sort of have those savings, sort of pay for themselves. In other words, if if someone's going to give me that that loan that the energy savings then make it pay for it. I think uh, it's not the cash for clunkers kind of a property you know, thing, but the ability to have financing available to make those smart money investments over the long-term duration of a project probably would provide those folks who might not have the cash flow. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like fast food, okay? It's not the best for you. It's artificially low in price, and it's convenient and easy, and it, and I, I don't know if people are physically wired to think past I'm comfortable, I'm fed, and I'm safe. Okay, so you just, if I, what I interpret what you just said is saying, uh, market forces alone cannot make this, the whole stock turn a corner. Uh, financing, it, you know, there's, there's financing and then there's, you know, other, there's resources. It, it takes a lot of things. It's it a little money. bit like the McKenzie graph. Every one of those things is going to have its own place and time, and right. incrementally, you're going to get there. But but but, but not with you know, not by private market forces alone. I'll let Dave answer that. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's a combination of things as well. I do think that market forces are going to be important. I also think that that there's going to be price driving this as well, energy price, and it's be a combination of of just a rising, just a continual rising cost of, of energy. I think some of this, this, this critical peak pricing, I mean, frankly, I don't think there's anything that scares me more than, than critical peak pricing. I and mean, it ought to scare my clients more because that's gonna really demand that during those 10 days or that one day that we really have a building that we can control with such specificity that it allows us to make those very quick changes to meet the either immediacy or the 24 hour. And I will tell you that right now, controls by and large aren't that sophisticated in most of our buildings. So if I get the call that tomorrow I have to reduce my energy by X percent, I'm scared. What I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna irritate that attorney on the 38th floor somehow, I'm sure. So uh, I think that's gonna be a combination of things. The critical pricing is gonna be helpful. And, and, and I'm actually one to say that, that energy ought to cost more. I think that if it were more costly, the same thing with water. 
I, you know, we, we argue about water a lot, and water is one of the biggest problems we have here in California. But it's also, it's one of the lead re prerequisites that you have to do to get uh, lead EB. And what we find, if you go into a building that doesn't have the new fixtures, and you have to actually do fixturization, there is, there's like a 12-year ROI on that, because while water, we all say, is so dear, it's still real cheap. So somehow the, the language doesn't fit. So I think that, it, that, that price signals will drive a lot of this as well, which you know, is gonna come to some degree by policy, you know, carbon cap and trade or some of those kinds of things where we monetize carbon and just natural increases in the cost of carbon and then the artificial pricing, although I wouldn't say artificial, the, the, the actual structure of pay for what you get when you get it, I think those will all move and help move this market. And additionally, I think there's gonna be a significant bifurcation of this market relatively soon you're not gonna be an A-class building. I don't care when you were built or how pretty you are, unless you can have certain energy and sustainability standards. That is now gonna be one of the differentiators for A. So, you know, will it all move? No, and I don't really know what you mean by turn the corner and where you really wanna be, but there's gonna be a significant piece of this stuff that will move by price and by tenant demand and by carbon. Uh, so I, I have a question I think for Alan, but it also relates to the McKinsey curve. I guess I wonder, the first graph that you showed up, um, that you put up before the scatter plot was the savings from code, but we've also heard how what can really matter is just how the building is operated. And so I wonder, and I've always wondered this with the McKinsey curve, whether you're assuming that it's operated by the best possible operator, the attorney on the 38th floor, yes. or whether you're assuming it's operated by the real person who's likely right. to operate I mean, it. Yeah. The answer is, the short answer is yes. I mean, the, to which? <laughs> to, to it, you're assuming that uh, the, you know, it's not the worst engineer. It's the engineer who's, who you know, does what McKinsey thinks right, they should do. Right, right. So, and so how much, how much smaller should the wedge be? Well, I guess, I, guess I, don't, I, don't think the, the, I don't think that's actually the right way of looking at the problem. I mean, I, I, nobody knows. I mean, you, can, you can get any answer you want. It's not even the operator. You can use different discount rates. Uh, it's sort of... You know, a, a meta fact about that is that uh, the lower the discount rate, the more savings that looks cost effective. And um, no, but but, but uh, I, I want to make it is for the, well, with the I operator. Make, I think it is the right way to look at it because that's how that's how much energy you're actually going to save. You don't have the you know nuclear engineer operating every nuclear power plant. You have the guy actually operating it, and you want to design to. Right. I guess so. So uh, I, I would. I would just on another point. There's a in the in the in the literature on uh, what McKinsey did. It's called energy efficiency potentials, and now greenhouse gas potentials. Um, the, the methodology has evolved quite a bit over the last 20 or 30 years. Okay, and so 20 or 30 years ago. Um, uh, people say that what has what now come to be called technical potential was generally reported. Well, if we go around and replace all of these, you know, everything we can replace with a more efficient one, wow, look at the energy we save. And uh, over time, it was realized that that's not, that's an interesting sort of outer envelope, but not the, necessarily the practical guidance. And so uh, there's, a, a, there's a nesting hierarchy. There's technical potential and there's economic potential where you apply some kind of cost effectiveness test. And then there's uh, different versions of achievable or practical realistic potential. And uh, when, when you, there's actually a lot, the, the, you know, the negative cost um, issue shrinks dramatically if sort of kind of a state of the art methodology is applied and one looks at just from this pure engineering perspective, the achievable potential. Um, uh, national long range aggregate studies, one gets, you know, looking at achievable potential, something like what California's already achieved, five or, you know, 10% over several decades. Uh, that's not what McKinsey did. And if you look at the fine print, uh, and you look actually at the two, both their reports in the last several years, uh, they just, they didn't say anything about how this would actually happen. I mean, th to my mind, there's a uh, certain ambiguity in what they did, but they just said, okay, here's the engineering estimate. We apply, you know, 7% or 5% uh, discount rate. Nothing about what's known about sort of natural frictions, even within energy efficiency programs. So, so uh, the, go ahead. Do you want, were you, I, I didn't want to cut go you ahead, off. Ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I think we want to uh, open it up to questions, um, but I'm going to take up uh, the chair's prerog moderator's prerogative and ask the first one. And that is, um, I wondered if we could spend a little time talking about what's happening here in California and the rest of the country versus the EU, um, where I think many folks in environmental design, for example, would uh, would argue that that. They're, they seem to be ahead of the curve on, uh, on, in terms of technology. But, but what about codes? Uh, is any of that related to codes? 
It's interesting, and you're talking about the United Arab Emirates and not the not the EU. Okay, okay, Europe. Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Dubai, that was big. <laughs> An indoor ski hill. Yeah. yeah, not not Dubai with the indoor ski. Uh, it, 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 it's interesting. Resort. I'm going to speak a little bit on it. Energy's been a lot higher in Europe for a long time, right? And so, in some of those price issues, and if you're going to label your building from A through F, um, that's not telling the market what to do. That's telling the market how to measure itself. And I think those kind of factors are extremely important. I would also challenge us to believe that. Some of those newer countries, whether it's China or the UAE or the rest of it, um, aren't sitting back and recognizing that energy necessarily has to be an uncontrollable cost of business that they've grown accustomed to wasting. Uh, I think that they, uh, it's like baseball. You have to touch all the bases. It's how long you sit at the bases. And I don't think that they necessarily want to be, for a, a country like China who necessarily doesn't have the petroleum resources, they certainly don't want them to be bound to a, a commodity they don't have control over. So in some respects, they actually have an opportunity as they build anew to have a much greater transformational component of their building. So in Europe's fairly old, a lot less development, a lot less building. Um, I think that's an energy issue. I think it's a cost issue. Um, and I think that is probably the, one of the best signs of why theirs is more efficient. It simply costs more. Yes. Uh, oh, I'm Severin Bornstein. I'm I'm Severin Bornstein. I'm the other co-director of the Energy Institute at Haas. Uh, first, I just wanted to address, I think there's a common confusion about critical peak pricing, uh, that those critical days actually would amount, if you ignored them, to increasing your monthly bill by an amount that's just in the noise, unfortunately, to me, in, compared to the weather. So those of you who might be fearing critical peak pricing, this is not something that's going to have a major change on your bill, because off-peak, your prices are going to be lower. And so for a typical person, a company that ignores it, they're going to see a very small change. It will be an opportunity to save, though. Um, but I have a different question, which is about this financing. And I, I don't get this, the PACE-type approach. And I frankly have not understood what the attraction is of the Berkeley program or the others that are being developed. The interest rates I've heard that are coming out of these programs are generally not terribly attractive interest rates. Um, I would think that a lien against a building, which is what they are, would be capitalized into the cost of the building. And people would, therefore, be less willing to pay for the building. And lien has always been a really dirty word in the past when you try to sell your building. And now it seems to suddenly be a very an attraction. Look, you get to keep paying for these solar, solar panels for 15 more years. Um, what am I missing? What is it that makes these sorts of programs attractive? other than sort of marketing that might be leading people to think they're getting something for nothing? <coughs> well, I can speak on behalf of the commercial um, building industry right now. Uh, right now, the commercial building industry is a mess. Uh, you might have noticed, I mean, there's a real capital crunch. There's, uh, there's no, no uh, capital in most cases um, for almost anything. And if there, even if there is a building that has capital, most owners are choosing to preserve that capital for use when that next tenant goes default or when their loan comes due or whatever. It's more, uh, you know, they're, they're concerned about the future. So there's virtually no capital available for major capital kinds of projects. So number one, that's, that's part of what's driving this. To, so now there's an, an availability, perhaps, of capital. Uh, none of our clients, frankly, have taken up any of this pace thing, and you know some of them may have some interest. And I'm particularly thinking again about solar, which again is the sexy sort of thing to this. But the other point to it is that, in a way, it's a lien that's not a lien because it's against the property tax. So you don't have to go back to your lender. You don't have to get lender approval. It's not secondary or primary to the loan and, and creates those kinds of liens. It runs with the property. And so in that fashion, it's at least it's a clever sort of, what, sort of way to, to in, in some ways, not violate or get involved with the primary lender, to find some additional dollars that presumably, even though they might be expensive, that the results that you get on an annual basis give you a better result than the cost that you're paying, so you get the benefit along the way, as does the next buyer and so on. So again, we haven't sold that to anybody. We haven't presented it to anybody. Uh, but I do know that there's a dearth of capital right now. There's a whole bunch of capital projects that may want to go, and that may be a, a, a possible way to, to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, Severin's a little taller than I am. Um, 
I wanted to make uh, one obvious comment and uh, a, qu a question for the illustrious panel. Um, the obvious comment to Catherine Wolfram is um, standards are a good idea, particularly if they're if they're modern, and I'll get to that. Um, but um, price is a darn good idea too, and so I think uh, we need every trick we can. We, we we need we basically need a carbon tax, and I guess we'll get there eventually. But um, it's um, hypocritical to have standards and uh, not get externalities into the carbon business. Um, a comment and a question about Title 24. First of all, the next Title 24, which will come out in 2011, will do two things. Uh, David Pogue, I think, made the excellent point that or both of you, uh, Williams too, that it's a good idea to get the dogs off the market with standards. And uh, as Amory Lovins loves to say, the standards are not very strict. Uh, if you were 1% worse than the standards, you would be illegal. Um, what we're gonna do at the Energy Commission uh, at tw in 2011 is to issue two sets of standards at the same time called Tier 1 and Tier 2. And tier one will be required, and tier two is a stretch standard uh, to which we hope people will strive as the emphasis on clean buildings goes on. Um, it has a certain advantage also. Right now, um, enthusiastic cities like San Francisco pass one set of standards, but Oakland may pass another, and Santa Monica may pass another, and um, the, the, the builder then, particularly if he's in the East Coast, the designer has to <coughs> face a non-uniform set of standards. If we have one Title 24 with a recommended stretch goal, uh, we'll get uniform, more uniform stretches across the state. And I, I think that's a good idea. I'd like to get your comments. Um, the other thing, uh, Alan, can you quickly go back to your maligned scatter plot? <laughs> yes. You want to redisplay it? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, according to AB 1104, I guess it is very good. Um, every building in the state, every commercial building in the state will be labeled. And then you folks have made the uh, completely excellent point that there's a big difference between the design, the x-axis, and the performance, the y-axis. We simply propose to give you both. So um, basically, you, what you'll get is Alan's scatter plot, except the word design uh, happens to be called asset value. And it tells you what you put into the building uh, in the way of better HVAC and controls and so on. Can I interrupt? Yes. So is that supposed to be a number? A number, what? Uh, a rating. OK. And it'll be con constructed of? Just, is it a, a, a dollar value or an index or a uh, an index? Okay, and then you will also get the performance, and you guys have to sort it out. Of course, I I, I, I would like to get your comments as to whether that's a value. But we we understand that it's a two dimensional problem, and uh, if the building is performing well under its asset, uh, then you want to worry about the dumb engineer and the Saturday effect and so on. Um, if the building is performing well above its design, that, that's a curiosity you might want to go investigate, too. But uh, I, I particularly like the fact that if we find, if we get a group of the worst 20% in the performance divided by the asset, then the utilities who are spending a billion dollars a year on uh, offering help and design assistance and so on can go after that very enriched tag where the improvements are possibly quite great. And it's a very interesting subset of buildings that we can help you look at. But I would like to get your performance on that because it's, um, unless somebody poo poos it, it, it's in the works. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, I'll respond on, on AB 1103 in particular. We, we are supportive 
of the general decision and, and the direction of AB 1103, and our clients are as well. Because again, we think that that is a benchmarking tool that allows you to understand where you, where you stand. And from our perspective, again, data is, is becoming one of the most important things, and, and we have so little data. Um, and so the more data we get, the more it allows us to, to make decisions and that other people can make decisions. Tenants can make decisions based on it, and we as owners can t make decisions on how to, how to take a bad building and make it better uh, and all of that. So we're very keen on data. The one concern that we have right now with AB 1103, when it's all commercial buildings, <clears throat> and it also includes industrial buildings, and right now there's an ongoing debate, you, you may or may not be aware of, about really who controls the data, because right now they're looking for the owner of the building to supply that data uh, to Energy Star or whatever the agency is that they're going to use. Um, the unfortunate thing is that we, in an industrial building, we don't pay the utilities and we don't own the data. And so we can't get the data. So there's a debate ongoing right now. We say that the utility company ought to put the data up, and the utility companies say the owners ought to put it up. And well, to me, it seems like the utility companies are the one who control that. So that will all be worked out uh, in some fashion. The other concern that I have about doing industrial buildings is that office buildings, while there is some variation in whether you have you know, the 24 seven, uh, and, and like most office uses are pretty similar. And so an office to an office to an office is gonna be pretty similar. An industrial building, uh, it has almost no uh, consistency and is 100% dependent upon the variable use. And so if someone is using it as information about what their performance is going to be, they may be sadly disappointed if what they're going to do is be a machine shop and the guy who's using it the, the, today is storing mattresses. So there's a, there's a concern about that and I don't quite think that AB 1103 uh, resolves that. Uh, you're, you're Second question had to do with increasing codes and providing a tier one and tier two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, can I make one? Oh yeah, please. To David? Mm -hmm. As far as I know, we have no plans to do industrial labor. Okay. <laughs> We've been on a number of calls that would lead me to believe that that they're that they well, want all uh, commercial buildings, not uh, just office buildings. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I personally at least agree that the industrial thing is pretty hopeless. Thank you. <laughs> uh, y yes, uh, Bill. Well, I think one of the things that is recognized is because whether California is number five or California is number 10, it is a major portfolio, whether you're an architect, an engineer, or a developer. And California's standards in terms of that tier one and tier two, frankly, the methodology to get there is the same. If you have to tell us how to do that, it's a problem. But if you're giving those thresholds and a performance-based analysis, that lets you judge between glass and HVAC and controls and all those kind of things that lend to the individuality of buildings. I think that's a powerful motive um, to, to make that work. I don't think the industry would have any issue with the different tiers of programs. Um, I think that it would let them have standards and benchmarks that they could then rate themselves against. Um, so I don't see any issue, and I think it's a pretty positive one that you talked about in terms of the tier. Um, and having people understand what they are, because frankly, those energies are based upon national ASHRAE, you know, 90.1, you know, kind of methodology just to the California standards. You're not rewriting the book, you're just setting different benchmarks on the book. So I think it's good. Thank you, and um, you know this, but I'm gonna make one comment to the audience. Um, we certainly aren't trying to write a prescriptive standard to which you have to adhere. Uh, I don't know the fraction of commercial buildings which are designed where the asset valuation would be done anything other than by a computer, and you can always trade off anything you want against anything else you want. Um, to my surprise, uh, among residences, um, commercial developments, large commercial developments, are 90% computer optimized these days. Uh, ba basically, the prescription standard is dead in California. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Alan. All right, wait a second. Uh, may I? Yeah. So, this is very interesting. Um, so suppose now we're in the system and the late, we have this two-dimensional disclosure. So suppose that you have a building and it's on the wrong side of the axis, okay? If I, under, if I understand Title 24 correctly, uh, and it's analogs elsewhere, uh, compliance means you're where you should be, uh, according yeah. to the, what you're calling asset value. So now suppose that uh, you have employees who are bringing their, their plasma TVs to work or something, not in California, but you know, Nevada forthcoming. <laughs> and so uh, how is this gonna work? So if, if the building is, is um, uh, uh, exposed, as it were, of being out of compliance by this, then what will the regulators do? 
when, and I'm asking this question because as I remarked, there's a part of the whole package that's moving forward now and the, is to try to greatly improve upon compliance around the country. Um, compliance, even in California, is a big problem. Oh, I know. And um, incidentally, on the figures which we, where we claim savings from policy and standards, we assume only 70% performance, uh, and the rest is, is uh, the wrong side of the right. axis. Um, we have a, a pretty ambitious set of hearings to go on for uh, the new, new standards. And uh, we, in principle, have uh, been assigned, we, the Energy Commission, has 400 employees, of which about 30 work on standards. Um, we've got an extra 10 to work on the p sorts of problems that you yeah. are mentioning. And where those hearings will go, I don't know. Thanks. Next question. Step up. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question about this idea uh, that price may be the driving factor for a lot of these green changes. Um, if the recent increase, or last year's increase in oil prices was any indication, um, that caused a public outrage, which really resulted in a kind of a supply side approach with proposals for drilling in Alaska and whatnot. So my question is, to what extent do you think these price increases will actually result in a public squall versus the kind of social responsibility that you're trying to elicit? So I'll get on my socialist side here. <laughs> the, um, there was a hue and cry at $4, and it went down not because we drilled in Alaska, but because of a variety of other market kinds of stuff. My suspicion is we weren't going to drill in Alaska. Uh, and my suspicion is that if utility costs continue to rise, we're not going to be building lots of power plants in California. There aren't a lot of places that want them. So I really think that, that efficiency and price is going to be driving this. It doesn't matter how angry kind of the, the public gets to, same, to some degree. I just don't see us building lots and lots of expensive power plants. So I think the price is going to continue to rise um, unless we can do, and, and I'm really always, fa I'm fascinated by some of the, the numbers that you had on, on just how much has been wrung out of, the, out of the system over the past 20 or 30 years by efficiency and how much it could be done if we just took that across the country. I think those are pretty startling. So I'm a big proponent of, of efficiency. No, I think it's important to recognize, though, that the, and both David and Art have made this point, that the prices, there needs to be a regulatory component to the prices to recognize the externalities. They, they need to be a carbon cap and trade or tax or something to, to make the energy prices reflect the carbon use. Uh, it, it, um, it's a very important question, and it's interesting. The What's going on, at least in, the, in the, uh, my Understanding in Washington, in, in the in the legis the Waxman, the uh, congressional legislation is there's you know, after all these decades the the idea of the importance of a market mechanism for this problem is sort of now uh, its day has finally come, but there's such great concern about the price impacts on consumers that an enormous amount of trouble is being gone to to try to mitigate those right. I mean, so we want. We want the uh, we want the market to, to work, but we you know politically everybody's really afraid that consumers will actually see the market at work, and a lot of the efficiency regulations. That, so what's happened is that the cap and trade systems are being proposed, uh, essentially side by side with the kinds of uh, you know dramatically ex, you know expanded regulatory efficiency policies, which are uh, justified in part by virtue of the fact that they'll protect consumers from price increases. So it's, we're, it's going to be a very interesting social experiment to see how this works out. I, I have this hypothesis that as sustainability trends continue, uh, not just in the commercial but in the residential, uh, and the, the sort of the information becomes more available to people, uh, this, is, this is going to help. I mean, uh, because nobody really knows. I mean, it's sort of the you know, old cliche in the energy efficiency world. Nobody knows how much they pay for electricity. Right? And a lot of people will, I think, see uh, sooner or later that their personal exposure to these prices increase is pretty modest. You know, that's just, I mean, that's not going to be true universally, but I think at least we'll finally, because of the technology and the, and the innovations going on, the regulation and so forth, we'll be in a place where this conversation can actually be had because people are going to sort of uh, know more about their own situation. Because right now it's really terra incognita. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. 
comment and then an integrated question for Dave and Phil. If you look at the scatter plot, um, the first 18 buildings along the x axis, the design usage, um, all fell on or above the line. So that just underscores the necessity for the building performance initiative that the USGBC is piloting, and I'm sure we'll hear from them later, but also to, to your points. Um, if there's going to be a significant impact in performance, um, it really has to be measured and benchmarked. And if we're going to measure our success by how many lead buildings are built and just stop there, um, th those, those ones that are being designed to perform the best are the ones that are all above that line. Um, so something just to keep in mind. And um, for Phil and David, um, David, are you guys at all um, working the split incentive issue into um, leasing? And Phil, you talked about technology. Um, obviously, you can't do anything uh, to address the split incentives without net metering. And so that requires a whole host of things um, on the technology side. So if, if the two of you could maybe talk about how those two issues interact, um, how to really get at that sort of you know, real time or at least um, you know, shorter period you know, benchmarking and commissioning and, and how that can then create value for your tenants. Well, yeah, one of the notes that I had here on it is as soon as people understand <coughs> that they have to pay for power, it becomes something that they can measure and monitor. And I think Dave could probably speak to that on the buildings where they have physically had a tenant metering opportunity. One of the things I think you recognize is that in existing buildings, pulling wire and copper and adding things to your building, independent of the cost, you have tenants in that building. And the ability, talk about pain, right? It's pain and fear. You don't want to ever get that call, and once you do, it's very painful. And so I'm looking to some technology that will lend us to go wireless so we won't be above the ceiling and we rely on, I think wireless is more reliable than copper these days. And I think that kind of inexpensive sensoring, metering, real-time information. If we had buildings that operated as good as SimCity, right, and where you could physically <laughs> predict it, I mean, th what could Dave do if he, he now, his chief engineer, could kind of play a game and understand what the scenarios were? That's not that far off. Or you could delete them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something like that. Re control, alt, delete, right? That's how I do play the game. Anyway, that's the kind of information that's coming right around the track that those early adopters are going to get, and they'll differentiate themselves. Uh, yeah, I'll just quickly on this. I know we're running out of time. First of all, those pesky tenants, huh? Um, and it is about metering. When we did our study with the 154 buildings, 23 of them had uh, net metering, sep uh, separate metering, and their, their utility costs were 21% lower. So uh, when people have the information, that's one of the key things you need in a green lease. There's a lot of debate going on right now about what a green lease is, and I'm a little bit concerned, frankly, in a way, because now a lot of people, for instance, our tenants have been willing to allow the Saturday hour change, or they're putting in recycling without it being in, as part of their requirement in a lease, or cooperating with them a variety of things, just because we make it the point. My concern is that as soon as we get these very aggressive tenant rep brokers and these very obstinate owners and put together now, and you have to put it in a legal document, and now there's responsibilities, and there's, uh, there's outcomes, and there's uh, problems. And I, my concern is that when we go to a more of a, of a green lease, we're going to see more problems in, in some ways than we have now. Uh, this whole split incentive thing, I mean, we don't always really see that. I mean, I, I know that McKinsey has said that that's a big deal. Frankly, most of our leases are, are drafted in such a fashion that to the extent that you save a dollar uh, and you're, you, can, you can put the cost of the capital in to reflect the savings that you have and, and we amortize them over time. And you know, the reality of it is that in most sophisticated buildings with most sophisticated tenants, that whole disparity really isn't as big a problem as it's made out to be. Good. We have time for, actually, I think one more question. <clears throat> I'm Bill Eisenstein. I'm from the Center for Resource Efficient Communities. We're actually in the College of Environmental Design under Jennifer's leadership. My question uh, actually has to do with something that Phil mentioned in passing in the middle of his talk, which is that buildings last a very long time. They stand there for several decades, maybe even centuries. As Alan pointed out in his talk, we, or alluded to, we need to be reaching a world by uh, 2050 where we are emitting 80% less carbon in absolute terms than we are today, which is really more like 90% in per capita terms. But we're already building the world of 2050 right now and in fact have been for a few decades now. My question then is very simple and very hard. <laughs> From the point of view of designing a building code, what do we do about this? What do we, how do we make some credible attempt 
to anticipate conditions that are that far in the future, but which we really do need to be thinking about in our construction decisions today. I, I think the issue is, is that if you try to engineer to what you think the future state is going to be, you're not going to be able to fully leverage those technologies. In San Francisco, for example, uh, the Green Building Task Force, we uh, sunsetted the Green Building Ordinance in 2012 because we couldn't predict the future rapidly enough. To be a rapid learner means you have to have a tremendous amount of flexibility, and codes aren't traditionally flexible. I think you need to write the most progressive code you can today and then give yourselves an opportunity to upgrade that code, provide new technologies, you know, and heaven forbid someday, uh, you know, require operational uh, testing, just like we do smog, as a, smog on our car today, right? There are precedents that said we have required people to look in the past. Now, I'm not saying we should necessarily do that today, but try to write a code that is based upon what might happen in 2050 is not what I would recommend. Uh, that is a difficult problem, and fortunately for me, by 2050, I will probably be dead. <laughs> yes, thank you all for coming. <laughs> That's the beauty of uh, long-range planning. You're never around to figure out if it worked or not. Um, I want to thank the panel, all the panelists, uh, for a very stimulating session, and the, and the audience uh, who, who provided uh, very tough questions, um, uh, and, we, and we got some thoughtful answers. So I think we're going to break for lunch now, and uh, we reconvene at, 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 um, after, after lunch. All right. Thank you very much.